You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. This is the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. Before we start today's show, investors should know that options involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. You should not enter into an options transaction until you have read and understood the risk disclosure document, characteristics and risks of standardized options. This brochure is available by visiting www.optionseducation.org or by calling 1-888-OPTIONS. OIC makes no recommendation with respect to any financial firm. OIC does not make any warranty as to the accuracy, usefulness, timeliness, or the continued availability or existence of information created or maintained by others. Multiple leg strategies involve multiple commission charges. Opinions and strategies expressed by others are not necessarily those of OIC, nor does OIC endorse, warrant, or guarantee products, services, or information described or offered by such firms. Commissions, fees, margins, interest, and taxes have not been included in any of the examples used in this show. These costs impact the outcome of all stock and options transactions. Consult your tax advisor about any potential consequences. None of the information presented in this show should be construed as a recommendation to buy or sell a security or to provide investment advice. Welcome to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. OIC was created in 1992 to educate investors and their financial advisors about the benefits and risks of exchange-traded equity options. OIC offers a variety of resources to those interested in learning more about options, including live seminars, webcasts, and podcasts. Check out www.optionseducation.org for more information. Now here's your host, OIC's Director of Retail Education. Education, Joe Burgoy. Welcome to OIC's Why World of Options. Thanks for joining us for today's show. Let's get started with industry happenings. It's time to get a handle on the latest developments from the world of options. It's time for industry happenings. In today's industry happenings, we want to update you on the number of U.S. listed option exchanges. Currently, they're 12. As of November 2nd, there'll be 13. BATS, the electronic exchange out of Kansas City, has received approval from the FCC for their second exchange, EDGEX. That will bring our count to 13. And then ISE, the first electronic exchange, uh, has a filing for their third exchange, Mercury, and once SEC comes back with comment and approval, the hope is that they'll get to launch their third exchange sometime in the fourth quarter. That'll bring the total exchange count to 14. That's it for today's industry happenings. It's time to meet the movers and shakers from the world of options. It's time for profiles and perspectives. On today's show, we'll be offering a double dose of Profiles and Perspectives. Joining us today on Profiles and Perspectives, I'm happy to uh, bring back Mike West and Barry Nobel, uh, who both are involved with managing the NASDAQ options business. Mike and Barry, thanks for taking time out today. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Joe. Uh, why don't – now, you guys uh, – have been kind enough to join the show, I, I guess, the last couple of years. So we're year three here. Uh, for those listeners who have not met you before, uh, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit about what you do at NASDAQ? You want to get started with that, Mike? Yeah, I've been at NASDAQ for 13 years now. Um, and for the last eight years, I've focused on our options businesses. So um, I was involved when we launched the NASDAQ options market, when we purchased Philex um, and everything since then. And Barr? I was part of the acquisition of Mike, so I'm an indentured servant. I just came <laughs> along with the, uh, with the, uh, the deal. Uh, what happened was I also uh, work on the options markets for NASDAQ and focus exclusively on the options markets. And um, we have a small group of us. We're two of a group of about eight 
So very small group that manages three options exchanges for NASDAQ. Now, uh, three options exchanges at NASDAQ. Why don't you just uh, give our listeners a, a quick overview of, of why three exchanges? Well, we have the original um, NASDAQ Philex market, and which is the old Philadelphia Stock Exchange, which is part of the acquisition. At that time, uh, Mike was working on a uh, NASDAQ options market, which was NASDAQ's um, entry into the options business. It's the NASDAQ options market, or otherwise known as NAM. We have our third exchange that Mike was instrumental in launching as well, which was the Boston license BX exchange. So it's the BX exchange, the NAM, NASDAQ options market, and Philly. And NAM uh, started in which year, Mike? 2008. 2008. Okay. And, a, you know, those three give us a lot, of, a lot of choice and a lot of ability to cater to different customers on different exchanges. You know, what happens is um, people say, why do you need three exchanges or why do you need three different markets? And, you know, the way I can explain it to the customers that I look at Hilton or I look at uh, Marriott Hotels, they have different brands. They'll have the um, Waldorf Astoria, something Hilton has. Of course, the regular uh, Hilton uh, Garden Inn. And Embassy Suites, it's something there for every segment of the people that they serve, their customer base. So your, your group of, you know, six to eight, you're constantly managing the needs of the clients as well as kind of the back end for the NASDAQ, is that right? Yeah, it's the needs of the client, it's, it's regulation, it's, uh, it's the pricing, it's, you know, how we, can, uh, how we can grow the business more and more. So that's day to day, that's what we're thinking of. Um, in addition to, you know, the other stuff. So strategy as well as the day-to-day operations. Well, you know, the options industry has really done quite well from a volume perspective when we look at essentially a, a relatively non-volatile marketplace over the last five, six years. I mean, we've continued to grow, whereas, you know, the equity side maybe not quite, you know, certainly like the options side. The usage, I mean, last year we were doing just under 17 million contracts a day through the various exchanges. Do you see usage uh, changing at all, the, the actual end user for options? I do. I see that options are starting to become a very mainstream part of anyone's portfolio. I look at a lot of the advisor community um, that are f- offices around the country from um, TD Ameritrade, Merrill Lynch, of course, Bank of America. The advisors are starting to use options with their customers to be able to enhance yield and we can talk about that. Okay. And also, um, especially in these, I don't want to say lofty levels, because every time I say lofty levels, I think of Dow Jones 800, thinking that was lofty. Um, loft, these levels of being able to reduce risk in the overall portfolio of the customer, that they want to know that they're not going to experience a 40% reduction in their in the value of their portfolio. So they want to use put options to be able to um, insure themselves the same way as some people use automobile insurance or life insurance. We all pay these dues. We all pay our premium. And we don't expect, at least I don't expect to ever, you know, collect on that. I'm betting right. against it. But if I didn't have automobile insurance, I wouldn't, wouldn't take my car out of, the par- out of my parking garage today. Well, so you really, you see an expansion in the financial advisor area, uh, speaking to their clients about, as you said, income generation, and then uh, portfolio protection, That's essentially. Right. Yeah. Okay. A, a lot of the self-directed, um, self-directed invest, you know, investors. Yeah. Okay. You know, they use the online broker dealers and they make their own decisions. I find that people that really don't understand, completely understand calls and puts, can talk to their advisor and through the strategists that many of these firms have. And we work very closely with, they come up with strategies that they can use in the best and the most appropriate use of options, not to speculate with them, not to use them for leverage to try to uh, make a tremendous amount of money, but just as an investment tool to be able to manage risk and sometimes enhance yield. So those brokers, or not the brokers, but the, uh, the end users, the, the client, really depending on the broker for the education in the option space. Exactly. You're seeing an awful lot of that. Something else we're seeing, which I find is really quite interesting, are um, funds that are starting to be offered to the customer that embed options, you know, exchange-listed options embedded in the portfolio of the fund. And are you talking about now uh, 
to garner, you know, some of this return, um, you know, in a covered call situation? Is that really what you're referring to? Yeah, the strategy is really quite unique. What they're doing of covered call, do you, you know, you might want to talk about that. It's just a selling an out-of-the-money call, out-of-the-money call to, um, you know, collect some premium if the stock doesn't go that high. But if you decide at that moment to, you know, you want to sell that stock when you buy it, I want to sell 10% higher, you sell that call. Because it's a strategy. You know exactly what you're going to do when you buy the individual stock or ETF. And what they'll do is, which also unique some of these funds, it'll be a completely funded put, which means that say, darn it, I wish I bought that stock. I wish I bought that stock and it's gone up a little bit. You can buy or you can sell a put at the price that you're willing to, that you were willing to buy the stock. And you sell the put, collecting the premium if it doesn't go lower. And if it does go 5 or 10% lower, you're happy to buy it. So it's completely funded. The money is already there. Um, and you can buy the stock at a lower price. Okay. For those, so for those lists, go ahead, Mike. Well, I, I, I think that the big message to take away from this um, is that the, the individual investor doesn't have to understand what Barry just said. Um, but I can take away the fact that if you're in a fund or if you have an advisor, um, you should be talking to them about options and making sure they're using options so they can protect your portfolio, so they can generate income in your portfolio, so you get the leverage of options without having to understand the details yourself. You have an advisor that you trust or you find a mutual fund that uses options. You can get the benefits of options without having to worry about puts and calls and strikes and expirations and you know that sort of Athletic thing. Let a professional manager do it. Now, one example. Great message. Well, I think uh, that, that's a lot for our listeners to take away from. Uh, before we wrap it up, how about if we um, just talk maybe a little bit about you know, uh, challenges, changes that you might see in the industry going forward? I mean, we, we've got 12 exchanges. We're going to be adding a few more before too long. That's one of them. Uh, but what do you guys see? You know, I, I don't know that there's the next big thing in options. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that there's, you know, the next big killer app or the next big killer strategy. Um, we, you know, we see more competition. We know there'll be more exchanges a year from now than there are today. Um, with the launch of NAM eight years ago, um, NASDAQ actually was the first new exchange in quite a while. Um, and since then, there have been a proliferation of exchanges. We think that competition has been good. We think it's brought prices down. We think that... Uh, a lot of customers' needs have been able to be satisfied by the different choices, so we see more and more of that. Um, we see a lot of regulation as well. Um, working with the SEC, working with the clearing corporations and stuff, uh, or the clearing corporation, we see a lot of risk controls being requested of us, um, which is good. Uh, reducing risk is, is really important, and, and is that, we believe in a lot. Is that, Mike, part of the fallout from 0809, this additional regulation? I'm not sure 0809 so much as just from 0809 until today. Um, we have a, a very well organized and very complex market, and we need to keep it. Uh, we need to keep the kind of the fence around it in the right places at the right times so that it doesn't go off the rails. Um, mm -hmm. And we need to, you know, the SEC is all about investor protection, and and so are we. Uh, and it, it, it's more than just a noble. A noble cause, it's essential. Um, we, without investor protection, we'll lose the industry, and, and we can't afford that. You know, our industry held up extremely well during the financial crisis of 08, 09. There was no systematic risk to our industry. There's no failure of uh, deliver. You know, we have a central cleared product, great credit rating, Options Clearing Corporation. Um, they just, the regulators want to make sure that it's maintained. And I think that every, anyone listening understands the way industry has changed for many, many companies or many industries in the last couple of years. I mean, travel agencies have changed significantly with the advent of online or, do, you know, Expedia sure. and Gymsia. I think that uh, it's easier to um, hotel rating companies. You know, we, we all... You know, everyone is now a critic. You know, we don't need Craig LeBaron or we don't need, it's, you know, TripAdvisor. Um, you know, we always look for social comments before we do anything. I think it's just the way our industry is heading and more social interaction. I think that the introduction of more and additional exchanges, you know, people don't realize that we currently have, Mike, is it 12 right now? 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Maybe it's 13. Maybe one was just added this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it'll be 14 very quickly. You know, there'll be two new introductions this year. And I think what that brings a heightened, um, you know, heightened uh, competition, additional competition with additional exchanges. You have additional competition. And the retail customer gets better service. Indeed. Well, some great messages, guys. Um, I think this whole idea of the retail investor not necessarily having to be an expert in the whole option space because options can be very confusing. So, to, you know, go to that broker, use that broker to potentially, you know, generate income through a covered call or maybe a cash secured put. Great advice. Use those brokers who are out there. Develop that relationship. And then, uh, as you say, secondly, the climate for investors, all investors, retail professional, seems to just continue to improve with the, uh, you know, the heightened oversight, the additional exchanges, lower pricing, uh, outstanding access. Um, Instantaneous all, execution. Yes. So um, anything else you'd like to add before we wrap it up? No, I want to thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Barry and Mike. We appreciate it. Thank you. Joining us today on Profiles and Perspectives is Chief Operating Officer at uh, the newly formed Option House Trade Monster Combination, Pete Platini. Hello, Pete. Hey, Joe. How are you? Good I'm to doing be here today. Well, thanks for making the time. Uh, tell, tell our listeners, if you would, um, you know, what you at uh, Option House and Trade Monster have put together in the last few months. Sure. Um, it was kind of a, a large effort, but uh, General Atlantic, a uh, venture capital firm, uh, pretty active in our space, uh, acquired uh, Options House and uh, Trade Monster last year. Uh, they closed the deal in September, and on January 22nd of this year, we combined entities onto one platform. So we took all of the retail clients of Options House and moved them over to the Trade Monster platform. Uh, so we have all, all the clientele on, on one single platform. Um, we've revamped the executive team. I came on board in the middle of October of last year, and we're working uh, very diligently to build out on the base that we have and uh, further uh, expand our presence in the self-directed retail options space. And that is an ever-growing space with more and more educated you know, retail customers out there. Yes, I, I, as we were talking about uh, earlier, the um, demand for the product is growing. I think the uh, realities of the market with a, a five-year bull run, and, and we have a little bit of a hesitancy here. We've seen some pockets of volatility. Uh, I think that lends itself to our product. I think our product is going to shine uh, quite brightly in 2015. And with that comes the, you know, the tailwinds of customers taking more control of their money, diversifying away from just traditional buy and hold strategies and educating themselves on the product. Education, as you know, is always the driver and the first entrant uh, into the marketplace for self-directed investors. And then it's about, you know, platform and service and, and, and the execution of the trades. Um, let me back up just a little bit in, in terms of Option House Trade Monster, two different firms, two different cultures to a point. Do you want to speak a little bit about, you know, the... Uh, you know the the plus plus in in bringing those two entities together. Sure, I think I think the option house uh, culture was built. You know, as a as they uh, spun off of Peak Six, was very much a uh, a sophisticated market maker culture that really understood the options product. They really understood the concept of risk reward, quantifying risk reward in trades. A uh, very advanced uh, uh, group of personnel. Uh, many of them came over from the Peak Six uh, infrastructure, as 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 you know, Peak Six is one of the larger liquidity providers and market makers uh, in the options industry. Uh, Trade Monster, uh, their biggest strength is their technology team and the platform. Uh, they had a little bit more advanced technology. They owned their own middleware, uh, which didn't exist at Options uh, House. So uh, the investors, when they when they put the two firms together, they were hoping to create uh, an environment where the best of both sides uh, led to uh, a multiple of what they what they put together. Very good. Well, um, you mentioned, a, you know, maybe a tailwind for the listed options industry here uh, through 2015, maybe because of the dynamics of the market. What um, what type, 
Are there favorite trades that you see from your client group, the retail group? Um, you know, tell us something about the fabric of your client. Sure, sure. I think, um, again, after a five-year run where, you know, you have a, a large segment of the investing public is sitting on some large gains, I think stock replacement strategies are first and foremost taking some of the uh, equity off of the table and utilizing the um, ability to put less money forth in an option is a long call strategy. Okay, so sell that underlying potentially and then replace it with you know some form of a listed sim- option. Yeah, yep. end up with a similar exposure with less money on the table. Yep. Uh, it's a great a great strategy, and uh, when you hit uh, kind of when the market starts to get a little toppy, it's a, it's a, it's a very popular strategy, and it's a great strategy for customers again, kind of um, sinking their teeth into the options product. And then the other big strategy, and, and we, we see this uh, uh, today throughout the industry when we have uh, a down 1% or down 1.5% today, we see a nice spike in the volumes. And I think that we have a large client base that are taking advantage of the increase in volatility to write out of the money calls, out of the money puts. Uh, they tend to be agnostic to price movement. They're just looking uh, to sell that insurance out of the money and collect a, a little bit of return uh, on, on their investment. So an example would be some of the high dollar stocks like a Google or an Apple, you know, go, going out of the money and, and harvesting some of the premium available in those stocks and doing it in a way where they have defined risk and, and defined reward. And as you say, I mean, it's been a at least five year bull run. Uh, premiums uh, have have been, you know, have been shrinking for years. I mean, we, we know the level of the VIX and things like that. You know, maybe the increased volatility. I mean, we really started seeing the fourth quarter of last year it didn't really translate into listed options volume in the last few months, although we saw some in January. You know, the liquidity in the market, the popularity of the weeklies, um, a, lot, a lot of things seem to be, you know, in the area of tailwind pushing the industry a little bit. Sure. There's, there's a lot of choice. Yep. Um, there's, there's, despite the anecdotal evidence that spreads are widening, uh, there's still, it's still a great product. Uh, it's accessible, electronic, very liquid, uh, no counterparty risk, uh, you know. I've been I've been I've been playing this tune for a long time. I, I I think the options product is is great, and again for the self-directed investor, it's just another tool to utilize, and they can utilize several different strategies strategies once they have the overall grasp of how the tool works. And and really that that I'm a big believer that uh, options are confusing. Yes, especially when you start, but not necessarily complicated. We've got a handful, you know, six to ten fundamental concepts that really define the options product. And from there, I think you can, if you take the time to get to know those half dozen fundamental concepts, you can really gain some confidence if the product suits you uh, to employ it the way you're suggesting, income generation, downside protection, and things like that. Yeah, what I, what I saw at Options Express in my, in my uh, 11 years there, that customers move along that, 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 that pendulum. They start off, they come in, they may be doing some simple covered rights in their IRA. Yep. Uh, they might be uh, taking a small amount of their portfo- overall portfolio and writing out of the money options, sp- mostly spreads, risk, risk reward defined. And you see over time their appetite for education, their appetite for literature around the product, their appetite for new trading strategies is, is pretty amazing. And they'll adapt over time to new strategies that suit them. And one of the best things about the self-directed investor that utilize options is they tend to d- adapt very well to changes in, in the markets. And that's why I think as this market seems to be getting a little heavy again, up or down, it might, it might, the rally might continue for another year, but we see signs that the market's kind of toppy. You'll, you'll see the, the more sophisticated retail investors that use options, they'll adapt very quickly to that. They, w- they won't be panicked on a downside. They'll be taking advantage of down days. They'll be taking advantage of volatility. And they appreciate the product. And, and, and I, again, I think our job throughout the industry is to b- bring the product to a, a, a more diverse audience, to a wider audience, and to continue to grow the pie. Well, and I think, um, you know, your firm, other competitors – have really done a wonderful job offering retail investors 
you know, the tools that many professionals only had access to not too many years ago. And I think that has helped, you know, obviously uh, the resources of the OIC help as well, but really firms like yourself have really done an excellent job helping uh, the retail client build that foundation of education. Sure. I think, I think the uh, media has done a terrible job in the last two years in particular in uh, scaring the retail investor away from engaging in the marketplace. Did you say two or 20 years? Yeah, well, I, th I, think, I think coming from the, the flash crash and from Facebook, the issues that NASDAQ had, I think they painted a very inaccurate picture of our business. We're the most transparent markets. We're the most competitive markets. The cornerstone is education. We have a great product that is a great part of any self-directed investor's portfolio. And the tools available, as you said, very sophisticated, high-level tools, access to real-time market data. You can argue whether you know, a high-frequency firm is getting the data milliseconds before the retail customer. I think that's a ridiculous argument because retail customers are not trying to outgame the high-frequency traders and get in and out of trades uh, in milliseconds. Right. It's a different business. It's a different business. And um, it's, it's a great product. Uh, the, the firms out there are very com competitive with each other. But as an industry, again, going back to, the, to my favorite word, education, the industry has a consistent effort to educate clients on the product. And once they're educated, it's a, it's a hop, skip, and a jump. They have several platforms that are very easy to use. They have tools that they can do their research on. They can manage their positions thoughtfully. They can manage risk thoughtfully. Uh, they can execute trades seamlessly, instant fills, great price improvement. Uh, again, the, the market and the market structure contribute very, very uh, well after, to the educated um, options user. And how about, you know, back to your clients, uh, complex orders, you started to talk about that a little bit. You know, what, uh, what types of things? I mean, there's a natural growth in, in the types of, of trades, but what do you see? Sure. I've, I've had a long history in, in a complex space. With, with Options Express, we were the first firm to offer the fully electronic experience of customers being able to enter a, a complex options order on one screen, have it go electronically to an exchange, and electronically get a fill or an out if they modify that order. Um, I think there's a lot more to innovate around complex orders, but customers are, are using them, again, uh, out-of-the-money call spreads, out-of-the-money put spreads, where the premium they receive versus the risk of the trade, it can easily quantify. In a low interest rate environment, they're looking for yield, and it's a way to gain yield, particularly across indexes or high dollar stocks. And they're also looking at uh, you know three and four leg trades as they get as they get further along on on their education. Mm -hmm. They're doing maybe some low risk butterflies, or they're doing you know condors, which again. They're agnostic to up moves or down moves as long as they're not big moves and they're selling, you know, selling the wings. And always uh, risk defined, which is, yes. you know, which goes along with that whole idea of, uh, you know, moving along that education curve. Definitely. Definitely. Um, how about challenges for the industry? Do you, you have, you know, do you see some, I don't know about dark clouds, but because uh, it really is the climate for the retail investor. As you say, the transparency, the access to the market, the speed of the markets. It, it's all pretty darn good. How about yeah, I, I think I think you know that the, some of the negative perceptions in the media uh, act as a headwind that we need to be conscious of and, and we need to overcome. But I think that um, the other issues are some of the macro issues that you, we've heard at the conference here, with regards to uh, you know the use of capital, uh, the restrictions on banks, the recapitalization of the OCC. Uh, those just those to me uh, act as somewhat of a, a distraction to our core business of grow, of growing the business, but I I think overall uh, the the story to be told is is a good one, and I think that we'll continue to see growth and you know I, I take it upon our our ourselves at, at Options House that we need to work very hard to grow the pie to bring more uh, participants to the table and give them uh, an experience that backs up, you know, how well the product behaves and how good it is for their uh, portfolio. Well, I'm sure uh, the combination of uh, Options House, which I think maybe started in 05 and then Option Monster maybe in 08, here we are in uh, 2015. I'm sure there are uh, more good things ahead for you and your group. Sure, very, very excited. Um, we, we've done a lot of work to bring the firms together 
and I think we're turning a corner. And a few the weekends of, worked there, Pete. Uh, it was a very busy January and February. Mm -hmm. uh, we went into tax time. We had a nice, steady uh, tax season, uh, as this was the first year that uh, options were included on 1099s. But uh, we've turned the corner, and we're very focused on growth. We're very focused on enhancing our offering, uh, focused on improving our service levels, uh, improving our, our systems, our resiliency, and providing a first-class experience for the customers that are, are you know, coming, coming. And we definitely feel that the demand is there for the product. Well, um, you know, we appreciate you coming out today, Pete. Um, wish you all the best with the new venture, and thanks for joining us today on Profiles and Perspectives. Okay. Thanks, Joe. It's a pleasure to be here. It's time to upgrade your options toolbox with cutting-edge trading platforms, devices, and information. It's time for tools, resources, and good reads. In today's Tools, Resources, and Goodreads, we're going to start with a discussion of the TRIN indicator. This is a market breadth measure that offers investors insights into overbought and oversold levels in the markets. Now, the TRIN is calculated the following way. We take advancing issues divided by declining issues and divide that figure by advancing underlying volume divided by declining volume. This calculation will offer a figure that ranges above and below one, one being neutral. When the ratio offers a reading below 0.8, the markets can be approaching an oversold level. Above 120 can be considered overbought. Now, it's far better to analyze this number in a 10-day rolling average rather than in isolation, and that's really quite important. You might be surprised how effective this trend indicator can be trying to detect overbought and oversold markets. And as with any indicator, it's best to use it in conjunction with other indicators. Now, today's resource I'd like to focus on is a little bit of self-promotion, but I want to be sure you're aware of our Options Industry Council, the OIC offerings. Check out our website at options Check out our website at optionseducation.org to see the list of live evening seminars we'll be offering across the country, and also check out our webinar schedule. The webinars can always be accessed on demand as well, rather than listening live. So again, that's optionseducation.org. Look for our live event schedule as well as our upcoming webinars. Lastly, today's good read comes from my colleague Mike McFarland. Mike suggests The Art and Science of Technical Analysis by Adam Grimes. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but the title is how I've always approached technical analysis. Part art, part science. Thanks, Mike, for that recommendation, and I hope you'll get a chance to check it out. Again, that's Adam Grimes, The Art and Science of Technical Analysis. Thanks for joining us today on Tools, Resources, and Good Reads. It's time for a nostalgia break. It's time to take a look back. In today's Looking Back, we're going to take a look at seasonal stock market trends. What's the worst month, historically speaking? What's the best? Are there larger macro trends at work as well? According to Jeff Hirsch, editor-in-chief of the Stock Traders Almanac and author of the 2012 The Little Book of Stock Market Cycles, market seasonality is a reflection of cultural behavior. We'll be inviting Jeff as a guest in an upcoming show, but for today, let's look at market returns over the past 65 years, focusing on the strongest and weakest months. Well, do you want to start with the good news or the bad news first? I'd like to say, since I'm an optimist, how about if we start with the best months first? Remember, depending on what index you're using, whether it's the Dow Jones or the S&P 500, we're going to actually uh, pass on the NASDAQ since that you know, started in 71. We're going to look at history going back to 1950. 
So depending on the index we look at, the Dow Jones or the S&P, those returns will vary a little bit. Starting with the Dow, April has offered the best return at plus 2%, followed by December at plus 1.7%, and November at 1.5%. In the S&P 500, the same three months offer the best return in a little different order, with December 1st at plus 1.6%, followed by November at one4 and April at just under 1.4% as well. If we put gains and losses aside and look at just months up and down over that 65-year period, December leads the way with 49 up months and only 16 down. Again, that's over the last 65-year span. April comes in second with 44 up months, 21 down, followed by March at 42 up and 23 down. Now, for all you bears out there, let's look at the worst performing months. September, yes, September leads the downside retreat over the period and actually leads it by quite a bit from a return standpoint. Looking at the Dow, September returns have averaged an eight-tenths of 1% decline, while the number's closer to 0.65 in the S&P over the period since 1950. Only three other months have negative returns in the Dow, June, May, and August, in that order, with June down three-tenths of 1%, May and August are down just one-tenth of a percent. The S&P has similar results to the downside over the same period. Now, as to why September has been so bad by comparison, a few ideas are that many companies, mutual funds and pensions, to name a few, end their fiscal year at the end of September, bringing sellers to the market in advance of year end. Another theory is that folks are back from summer vacations and come back geared up to address their portfolios. I'm not sure about the legitimacy of either theory, but both of them are out there. Big picture, going back to 1901 to present day, prior to 1950, statistics showed buying the market in May and selling towards the end of the year seemed to work pretty well from a seasonality point of view as well as returns. Since the late 80s, stats now show the opposite is true, with best returns coming with an October purchase and a May sale. Lots of stats and returns for you today in looking back. Hope you've grasped some of them, if not all. Thanks for joining us. You've been listening to the Options Industry Council's Wide World of Options. If you have questions about anything you heard on today's show, email Joe Burgoyne at options at the OCC.com. Or you can call OIC's Investor Services at 1-888-OPTIONS. Interested in connecting with OIC on social media? Like the OIC page on Facebook. Follow them on Twitter at options underscore EDU. Or join their group on LinkedIn. Thanks for listening. And be sure to check out our next episode of the wide world of options. The preceding program was a production of the Options Insider Radio Network. For more quality options programs, visit www.theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app, available in iTunes and on Google Play. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, facebook.com slash the Options Insider or via questions at theoptionsinsider.com.